There's not a single verse in your Bible where Jesus claims to be God. You must have never read the Bible then. Then show me where Jesus said, I am God. Oh, that's easy. You got John chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. Case closed. Nipped in the bud. Are you serious? In that same book, in John chapter 17, verse 11, Jesus, peace be upon him, prays to the Father, asking for the disciples to be one, just as we are one. Does that make the disciples gods as well, then? Uh, yeah, but that's... Or what about verse 21, then? Where Jesus, peace be upon him, yeah, says, for they are to be one, just as I am in you, and you are in me, let them be one in us. <laughs> How many persons do you have in your Godhead, man? You... Now that didn't go so well, did it? But don't you worry. There's definitely an effective way to use John chapter 10, verse 30. And here's how. It's God. It's God. It's God. First and foremost, we need to understand what John chapter 17 is talking about in order for us to differentiate between the oneness that Jesus mentions in John chapter 10 versus the oneness he mentions here in John chapter 17. Just at a quick look at this, you can tell through the context that it's about evangelism. When we take a closer look at verse 9, for example, Jesus begins to say that he's praying for the disciples specifically and not for the rest of the world. And so he's focusing on the disciples and he tells us why in verse 11, where he begins to say that I am no longer in the world, but they are still here in the world. So he's asking the Father to protect them so that they remain to be one and united just as Jesus and the Father are united, perfectly and inseparably. And so this becomes a little bit more clear also when we jump down to verse 20, when he begins to say that he's praying for those who come to belief after hearing the message of the disciples. So it's through the disciples that others will come to believe. And then Jesus says in verse 21 that may they all be one, all believers, disciples, and the believers that come after the disciples to be perfectly united, to be one just as we are one, to be one in us just as I am in you and you are in me. So the idea here is for the believers to be perfectly united, inseparable, just as the Father and the Son are perfectly united, inseparable of one mind, one message, one purpose. And this comes full circle as he repeats this theme in verse 23, where he says, may they be completely one, perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and that you have loved them. What Jesus is saying is that the evidence that the disciples have the truth, the evidence that the believers are in the truth is their unity and their accountability towards each other being of one mind, one message, and one will, one purpose, spreading the gospel and pushing the kingdom. So then that leaves us the question then, what is Jesus talking about in John chapter 10? When he says, I and the Father are one, is Jesus just simply saying that he and the Father are perfectly united and just uh, under one mind and in purpose and in, in message? Are they united in will? Is that simply what Jesus is saying? Just how the disciples are united? The way for us to understand what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10 can be surmised in one word, context. We have to read the context in order to get the full meat of what Jesus is saying. You don't want to start with the punchline with, uh, without the buildup. Who starts with the punchline? You do the buildup first, you work the buildup, and then the punchline lands. That's how you effectively decipher scripture. That's how you effectively get the meaning of what Jesus is saying. Uh, or really anyone is saying when it comes to scripture. So when we take a closer look at the context of what Jesus is saying, the depth of what he's saying, it begins long before verse 30 where he says i and the father are one that's the punchline but we got to look at the build-up for instance when we look at verse 11 jesus begins by saying that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep now i want everyone to pay attention here jesus is going to continue this theme of shepherd and sheep and this is where I want you guys to pay attention because Jesus brilliantly lays down the buildup 
to what he is really trying to say and get them to understand. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And then again, in verse 14, he repeats this saying, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. I want you guys to watch this. Watch the language here, key words here. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. Who's the shepherd? Who's the sheep? That's what I want you guys to pay attention to here because this is going to come full circle later on. Verse 15, he goes on and, and repeats the theme. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, but I will bring them and they will listen to my voice and they will be one flock with one shepherd. Notice what Jesus is saying here. He says that he has other sheep that belong to him and his sheep hear his voice. They respond to his voice because he is the shepherd and the sheep belong to him. So key phrases here. I am the shepherd. They are my sheep. They hear my voice. Watch this build up. Jesus is a genius for this. And so he continues on in verse 17 and 18. He says, I am laying down my life on my own accord. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the authority to lay it down and to take it back up again. This charge I have received from my father. Does this sound like anybody who believes that he's just a prophet and he believes that he's just a good servant of the Lord, the, the one who's just united in his mission with God? Absolutely not. No prophet. And I dare any Muslim to show me a single prophet that can say that no one can take his life, but he is the one who lays down his own life and he can take it back up again whenever he chooses to, that he has the power and the authority to lay his life down and to raise it back up. Only God can do these things. And so here we have the build up. Jesus is building up his claim about himself and adding little nuggets in here that a lot of people will miss, but not the first century Jews that he's talking to. He's claiming to be the shepherd. He's claiming that the sheep belong to him and he's claiming that they hear his voice and that he is the one who can give his life and raise it up again by his own authority. That's what he says. So he's laying the, the build up now. He's laying down the groundworks to show how he is divine. Then they begin to ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? Just tell us plainly. He answers and he says, I told you, but you don't believe me. Why? Because you are not my sheep. Now this is where it gets good. Verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Y'all caught that, right? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Again, verse 28, watch this. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them, key phrase coming up, out of my hand. Why is this so important? Because number one, first of all, we see that Jesus claims that he is the one that gives eternal life to the sheep, to those who hear his voice. He is the one that gives eternal life. My question to my Muslim friends here, who is the one that gives eternal life? Be careful now, before you answer and try to defend this, do not commit shirk, okay? Be careful, I'm trying to help you. Who is the only one that gives eternal life? I want you guys to comment that in the comment section, but it's pretty simple. So Jesus claims to be able to give eternal life and my sheep hear my voice and no one can snatch them from my hand. Why is this important? Because Jesus is alluding to Old Testament passages, claims that belong to Yahweh God and Yahweh alone. For example, he quotes Psalm 95 verses six to seven, where the Bible says in Psalms 95, it says, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture the sheep of his hand. So what is the theme, the groundwork that Jesus laid out here? My sheep hear my voice. They belong to me. I give them eternal life. No one can snatch them from my hand. But according to David, the sheep are, are, are in the hand of Yahweh and, and the sheep are in the pasture of Yahweh God. So if Jesus is saying that the sheep belong to him, 
and that no one can take them out of his hand, then who is Jesus claiming to be? The, the Jews would have understood exactly what Jesus was saying, which is why they tried to kill him. I want you guys to pay attention. Again, my sheep hear my voice and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Watch this. It continues and says, today, if you hear his voice, I'm still in Psalms. It says today, if you hear his voice, so whose voice is the sheep hearing according to David? They're hearing Yahweh's voice. Who does the sheep belong to according to David? They belong to Yahweh. Whose hand are the sheep in according to David? Yahweh's hand. But Jesus says that the sheep are in my hand, they hear my voice and they are my sheep. Jesus is laying the groundworks claiming to be Yahweh of the Old Testament here on earth in the flesh. This gets even more drastic. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we see this theme again. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. God says, see now that I alone am he. There is no God but me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can deliver out of my hand. Wait a second, Jesus. Why is Jesus mirroring the statements of Yahweh in Deuteronomy chapter 32, where Yahweh is the one who gives life. Why is Jesus saying he is the one that gives eternal life? This is the buildup and we're not at the punchline just yet. But Jesus says, I give eternal life, while Yahweh is the one that says he gives eternal life. Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hand, while Yahweh says, no one can deliver out of my hand, my hand, my sheep hear my voice, the voice of Yahweh, the hand of Yahweh, the sheep belong to Yahweh, and he is the one that gives life. Now let's see and continue how Jesus wraps this up, because now we're going to approach the punchline. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. They will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, watch what he says. My father, who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So Jesus says, not only is the sheep in his hand, but the Father has given him the sheep and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. So the sheep are both in the Father's hand and the Son's hand, and the Father is greater than all, which also means that Jesus is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand because he's greater than all. Jesus says the same thing about himself. No one can snatch them out of my hand. He is equating himself with the Father in this instance, not just in purpose, but in essence. And then comes the punchline. I and the Father are one. Is this one in unity, one in purpose? Sure, yes, but not entirely. This is one in essence, equal ontologically. Jesus and the Father are the same ontological being with all power, all authority, all might, and are able to give eternal life to the sheep that hear his voice and who are eternally protected in his hand. This is why the Jews sought to kill him later on in the next verse. It says, and again, Jews picked up stones to stone him. So what I want you guys to take away from this is that context is the key. Start with the buildup, not with the punchline. That's important because with unpacking what Jesus says in John chapter 10, he clearly makes claims to his divinity, which is why the Jews would have sought to kill him. And they did. They sought to kill him for what he said because they understood that he was claiming to be Yahweh of the Old Testament who owns the sheep, whose voice is what the sheep hears, and it is he who is the one who gives the sheep eternal life. That's who Jesus is, Yahweh God of the Bible. Case closed. Oh my God! Logic.